Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 115, Science Faction Ununpentium. I got nothing. Every week I keep expecting these elements to end. Is it Unun or is it Unun? I don't know. Is it Unun? I don't know. You're the physicist. I just figure it's un unpent- It sounds like the name of a really shitty computer in the early 90s. I think it's, yeah. it's an ununpentium processor. With 10 megahertz of power. <laughs> oh, I you- think I figured it out. I think it stands for unnamed 15 or 5. Yes, I think you're right, actually. Uh, if That's you guys- why the fucking name sucks, Latin. <laughs> I'm going to go punch an Italian. You guys remember the un-un ones? We've talked about this the last few episodes. The un-un ones mean that th- that was essentially a placeholder for a specific element that once discovered and recognized and everything like that would officially get its name so you will recognize that because the name of this it means it hasn't officially gotten its new name yet as have the last two elements that we've talked about eventually when this element is named are we going to go back are we going to break from whatever naming scheme we're doing at the time Mm -hmm. to cover these elements i need to know for science faction 1007 when we run out of elements yeah, we run out of elements. We're going to go on to the next thing. Right, right, right. right. Eventually, at some point, years down the road, assuming science faction is still on, right. I need to know. I need to block off the time and start eventually, writing the jokes now. For eventually, consistency, you go back to have the actual name. Yes. When we get out, when we run out of elements to do for science faction, we switch, as we've talked about before, to euphemisms for dong. So, Ununpentium, <laughs> my new euphemism for dong, was first synthesized <laughs> way back in the old days of 2004. Likely by candlelight, I assume. That's what they used back then. It's when Abraham Lincoln was, like, writing and stuff, right? It's back when NSYNC won the War of Independence. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> That's right. So since the IUPAC just recognized the discovery in 2015, the group will now get to permanently name the element. And the ideas going around are Angevinium, after Paul Langvin, or Moscovium, which I'm sure some right-wing Republicans are going to be really happy if that gets on the periodic table. Because Obama is in office, Putin thinks he can enforce his code on the nuclear commission. I mean, this was jointly discovered by a team in Dubna, Russia, and uh, Lawrence Livermore Berkeley Labs, so, you know... They're a bunch of commies. A bunch of commies, both sides. Give Mr. Livermore such a hand job on this show every fucking week. (laughs) Both sides, a bunch of commies. So the, the, the Moscovian thing would be particularly interesting because it would at least give them something other than biology to hate. They're like, we can't teach biology or chemistry in schools. You can't have Moscovium up on the board. It disproves Reaganism. Ha- have everybody just pray into Stalin, why don't you? <laughs> I do like that the guy that they might name it after, Paul Langvin, he was a a physicist in the early 1900s. He helped develop an ultrasonic submarine detection system all the way back in World War I that was semi-effective back then and then was later used in World War II. His other accomplishment, which was even better than that, is that he banged Marie Curie. Oh, poor guy. I don't know if that's something to brag about. (laughs) Well, here's what sounds like a desperate act. You know what? I'm gonna. I got a theory here. You ever look at your mom's yearbook and like, well, is wow, everybody was a lot less hot. Maybe going back, maybe Marie Curie was super hot at the time. Yeah, she, women just weren't super attractive. She was the I, the best looking woman around at the time. I think back then it's just because they had weird haircuts. Yeah. We think that we were India they still at some had point. Hot bodies, but Marie Curie didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but this was after uh, her husband Pierre had gone. Uh, he she started shacking up with this dude. So it wasn't even when she was young. No, not when she was young. When she was old. That guy must have been really desperate. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, She's uh, uh, loaded. So he was begging her. And what's interesting, obviously, this is long after they had both had kids and everything. They were much, they were, they were much older in their lives. You mean with Pierre had kids. Right. She had kids with Pierre and stuff. Now she's banging this dude in her old age. Uh, so the, obviously, the, she and, and this guy didn't have any kids. Now, in 2016, one of this guy's grandkids is actually married to another one of Marie's grandkids. So uh, interesting, weird, pseudo-incestual relationship going on in the physics community there. We're going to do what our grandparents couldn't, produce offspring. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you're ready to make a unified genitals construct. (laughs) Oh, very, very good. I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Ricardo. Damien, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, but I'd like to protest in this episode. We're doing this episode on a Saturday because tomorrow is Sunday, Easter. Right. Uh, Why you bound down to Big Pope, Bobby? (laughs) Just so you know, I have no allegiance to Big Pope, but I am completely bought off by Big Bunny. You have allegiance to Little Pope? Because I think the Pope's kind of a small guy, isn't it? It's (laughs) L-I-L. Little Pope. (laughs) 
That's a little more hip than the previous folks. <laughs> and our own physicist slash rap, Little Seb, how are you doing today? Pretty good. I've taken time away from my recording uh, career. <laughs> You're a man of many talents, yeah. Little Seb. Uh, and we, of course, are broadcasting here from the Madhouse Comedy Club. We're now live at Table 60. This is uh, my new favorite place in, in Madhouse. It's the main table right in the middle. It's the best place to come if you have a big group to come here and watch a show. And they're doing this because they're opening a new fine dining restaurant in the front room where we have been broadcasting for the past few years. Come on out and check out that restaurant along with Madhouse Comedy Club. Uh, get some decent food and laugh your ass off at the place where your favorite science podcast is taped. How much longer till they call Table 60? The Science Faction Table. One second ago. And let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, first article, no frilled cell. So very, very interesting. Craig Ventor, who is a very, very interesting biologist that we've talked a lot about on this show, one of my biology heroes, he's got this very interesting, almost like superhero biology past, and he has just done something new and interesting. So let's start way back. Craig Venter was part of the Human Genome Project back in the early 90s when they were trying to sequence the human genome for the very first time. I thought that was a boy band. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Human Genome Project? Yeah. They're like, <laughs> we took the sexiest scientists and made them into the Human Genome Project. Much like the Ninja Turtles and how they were named after Renaissance artists and stuff. <laughs> Venter. <laughs> it's Crick. <laughs> <laughs> da Vinci could have been in both. Right, it could, absolutely. Uh, so Venter was in the Human Genome Project back in the early 90s, and as he was doing it, he realized that the method in which they were using to analyze the genome was incredibly out of date. He found a new method called the shotgun method, which he thought worked much better. He took it to his bosses at the NIH and said, hey, I've got this great method. It's going to work a lot better. And they said, eh. We do things the way we do things at the NIH. You don't tell us, Craig Venter. We like the Macarena. We're not ready to pop lock yet. Right. So Craig Venter says, uh, fuck you guys. I'm a super genius. I'm just going to go off, start my own company, and start sequencing the human genome myself. He did so with an eight-year deficit, meaning for eight years, the entire forces of the U.S. government through the National Institutes of Health had been pursuing the human genome project, trying to sequence the human genome. He starts eight years later with his new modified technique and beats them. He finishes before they finish. It almost became such a mockery that Bill Clinton had to arrange a meeting where officially Craig Venter's group came, shook hands with the NIH, with Francis Collins, and said, uh, hey, we're teaming up to finish up yeah, this project. It's actually not that impressive because the guy he was up against thinks the Earth is 6,000 years old. Well, to be fair, Francis Collins, a very famous evangelical Christian, was the head of the NIH, very big deal there, uh, was not a young Earth creationist. He's not a 5,000-year-old guy. Oh, he's right. not? No, no, no. no. Are you saying is it possible that he just lied on his resume? Are you a young Earth creationist? No, but I'm not going to lie. I've been to some churches. Are you saying he was sandbagging this project, Seb? I'm saying he's a nutty Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more. But Venter went and he beat them out, so he obviously already was on a roll. He started doing more and more stuff. He took this great uh, yacht trip around the world in his private yacht and collected all these water samples, which he then analyzed and, and basically vastly increased the amount of known microorganisms of a certain type on the face of the earth. Uh, and then he really shattered everybody's expectations and made news back in 2010 when he created the first artificial cell. So he literally took little parts, like he took adenine, thionine, guanine. He put together the, g the genome. He inserted this genome into a cell, uh, like a cell body, a sterilized cell body, and then shocked it with electricity and started it going. He created life. He, he literally, out of just raw materials, threw them together and created a living thing. Like Frankenstein, did the residents of La Jolla burn the cell in, its, uh, in the lab? Yes, they wanted to kill it. Of course, this was did done. Did the cell have a metal bar in its neck? A scar oh. across its forehead? Yeah, they were all very Frankenstein-like <laughs> cells. At that point, he had just used a, a standard yeast cell. He had taken one with a very easy-to-replicate uh, genome. He built it ad hoc and then started up. So he created his own version of a standard natural yeast cell. In this case, what he's doing is saying, I wonder what the minimum amount of genes a cell can have and live would be. And this has been a question in biology for a while now, ever since we've gotten to genomics, because of the problem of junk DNA. So a lot of people don't realize that most of your DNA is junk DNA. I always thought junk DNA was the DNA of the penis. I thought that was just specifically the penis DNA. First of all, that is incredibly offensive and completely inappropriate and everyone knows junk dna is actually just the dna that codes for really big asses so <laughs> uh all in that trunk uh, 
So we most of our DNA is junk DNA. And that's really interesting. Only a little bit of our DNA actually codes for proteins, which means makes us who we are. And then a little bit of more DNA, about 8%, I think, modifies those coding proteins a little bit. So it has some effect as well. The rest, up to about 85, 90% of all the DNA in your genome is useless. It doesn't code for anything. It doesn't modify codes. Maybe it's got something. Maybe it does something on the periphery. But because it's not shared among a lot of different species or a lot of different people, it doesn't seem like because then otherwise we wouldn't be able to do whatever it is those things do if we didn't have that part. So we seem to have this junk DNA. And you might think, why do we have this? Well, it gets really into the history of biology, uh, the idea of natural selection. We think of natural selection working on a species. We think of it, okay, well, this species, the, the best survive, that one, that one moves on. Well, a long time ago, Richard Dawkins introduced the idea of the selfish gene, which is that natural selection doesn't work on the level of the species. It works on the level of the gene. If a gene provides benefit to the species which has it, that species will keep passing that gene on over and over again. So it's the gene that ends up benefiting. But here's the thing. Like most genes, eventually that gene can turn off or change or do something. But if that gene hangs on to another one that is doing something, it keeps getting propagated. This was the idea called the selfish gene, meaning as long as that gene used to have a function or is near something that does have a function, it can keep getting passed on. And it is the ultimate winner of natural selection. It's getting propagated millions and billions of times over and over again in every single cell from every single descendant of that animal until that gene goes away. Well, all this junk DNA builds up. And it's not just stuff that, like, it catches on that way. Uh, in terms of any time there's a transcription, there can be transcription errors where you take one segment of DNA from one place, put it in another, and it's not doing anything. All of that add up to us having this massive amount of basically junk DNA. And it's not just us. It's basically all creatures on Earth. So Venter wanted to see, what can we do? How can we trim this DNA down to get to what is absolutely necessary. So he took Myoplastia mycotes, which I think is actually fairly closely related to the species that he, he artificially created back in 2010, and he wanted to see how far he can whittle that gene down. They thought they might be able to get down to 250 genes. It's like the price is right. How low can we go? Right. The guy next to Craig Venter, he's like, mm, I'll take 251. The actual <laughs> gene count is... If you get rid of all these genes, do you end up with a situation like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, where everyone's much smaller? Because... Yeah, of course. Obviously, it would make sense that with a smaller <laughs> genome, human beings would just shrink down. <laughs> Less mass. So they did it with this bacteria, this very, very simple bacteria, and, and their, their process was really interesting. They got a substrate that this bacteria loved to grow on. They let it all grow on top of that substrate, and then they basically started pulling the bacteria out, removing a couple of genes, putting it back, and seeing if it survived. And they did that over and over again, and they were hoping to get all the way down to about 250 genes and all that dna weight gone yeah it's the best diet you've ever had <laughs> but when they ended up doing it there's about 150 to 170 genes that when they took out all of a sudden the organism couldn't live anymore it didn't prosper anymore they don't know why they can't see what it's doing they can't see what it's coding for but it's somehow crucial there so they got down to for this particular species exactly the minimum number of genes that they could possibly have which turned out to be 473 very interesting because that is a very very basic creature 473 genes is not a lot like you craig venter could probably print that up on a 3d printer pretty quickly well maybe it's not the size of the gene that matters maybe it's how how we use it and, and, and you know maybe, maybe the genes are willing to go downtown you don't know <laughs> that is true damien it is not the size of the gene uh, yeah, right. we like to think of ourselves as very advanced we have about twenty thousand genes but uh Quite frankly, we're not even close to the top numbers. There are other animals that have uh, hundreds of thousands of genes. So, you know, the fact that we consider ourselves advanced and we only have 20,000 genes means that the number or the length of the genes, as Damien pointed out, that is not the end game. We're like efficient. We're like the uh, German or Japanese of the uh, genomic world. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so this is super interesting <laughs> coming out because Craig Venter's other big thing that he's doing on top of creating life and finding new life and human genome and stuff is creating microbes that can produce things for us. His company produces microbes now that are literally making diesel fuel. Like they're photosynthesizing and their output is a diesel fuel. He wants to keep using microbes to produce these useful things in such a way that's very cheap, easy to do, low production cost. I mean, basically, you take a vial of this bacteria over to whatever it is your substrate is, put it on it and ma'am now we got diesel fuel you know it's a very easy process 
If you use, live in San Diego, you can see the Cal Worthington S commercials. We got microbes for everything. You need <laughs> DNA. We got our prices are so low. It's a regional thing. If you don't live in San Diego, you won't get it. But yeah, it's a really interesting idea because if you start from scratch and build a whole new creature, you're going to need to know the minimum requirements. And one of the ways to do that is to take a whole bunch of different type of bacteria, a bunch of different type of yeast, whittle them down to their most Does that minimum include, genome, like yeast infection yeast. Yes, absolutely. Take all of that, bear them down to their minimum genome, then see what they need to survive, and see if you can't build something completely new. But this is how you do it. You look at what exists, you look at how that thing that exists works, you've got to knock all that junk DNA out, and that's what they're, they're pulling off in these labs. This is really interesting, because this could be the start of you carrying a vial into a third world country, and instead of saying, hey, we're starting a fish tilapia program and rice grow in this really poor African place, you just show up and dump a vial of bacteria out on some sage grass and a bunch of corn and bananas grow out. <laughs> it's kind of like the MacGyver of the genomic world. Yeah. Like, uh, they, like people will leave them in very specific science Give me space. a rubber band and a paper clip and I'll make your genome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's very interesting because it will also push the boundaries of what life is and what currently non-existent life we might create. I mean, again, he is just working with, with already existing living things. What happens when he starts making something brand new? This is a thing. We can't call it a bacteria or a virus or a protozoan or anything because it's none of those. It's a whole new thing. I've just created it uh, from scratch, from the genome level up. It's going to get to some really interesting, weird, ethical, and, and moral issues. He really is pushing the boundaries. He's San Diego's Andy Warhol. <laughs> uh, so question number one for you guys. What are the ethics of life creation on the bacterial scale? Do we have to worry about ethical considerations of bringing a completely synthesized species into the world? And if not, what level do we have to worry? I think the moment you squirt that Petri dish, it's a life. You are, you are a life at conception. <laughs> But, I mean, do you have to worry about that? So, obviously, when researchers now are working with bacteria and stuff, they don't have to do a lot of, unless it's they're pathogenic or something, they don't have to do a lot of IRB stuff where they have to worry about the ethics of working with bacteria. You know, we accept that you can kill bacteria fine. Oh, there's a lot of things we accept we can kill. Right. So it's some, Much more advanced than bacteria. Sure. But at some point, it gets to an area where we don't accept that, right? So it, if he were to say, I'm building a human being that's, that has a human brain or something like that, but I'm taking out the junk DNA, we would not accept that that could be a lab specimen that could be treated however we wanted, right? We would, we would assume that would have some rights. Well, where does that come in? Where, do the right, where does the line cross? I think it's very subjective. Yeah. We just, if they're similar to us, that tends to be the rule. The more similar they are to us, the more we have to take care of them. Yeah. I think I speak... For myself and most of my fellow right-wing male crowd, is how fuckable is it? Like, how attractive is it? Like, is are we building a species of better model? Are you model? saying are that building right a better breast? females don't think that way either? <laughs> Listen, I think they like that is pretty sexist, too. Damien. Me and Carly Fiorina <laughs> were at a strip club not more than ten nights ago. <laughs> okay, so like, could you if if he was like, all right, guys, I'm going to create a puppy out of nothing. Now, would we have some ethical considerations? Oh, I think we might love puppies, right? Of course, we would. Yeah. So would we would say like, okay, fine, but you can't torture it and you can't just kill it for no reason afterwards at what point do we start putting those things on there like if he creates a mouse we use mice all the all time right. for crazy experiments so can we tell him you can't create a mouse and do it and what if he's like well i created this mouse but it actually has the intelligence of a dog does that change things where is it once we start talking about species that don't currently exist but can exist from a blueprint somebody creates in their own head where is it that we start granting ethical rights and considerations what does the mouse do around peanut butter uh, this, I need to know. This is a background question. Don't this, ask me why. This might solve your, the whole problem you've been complaining about for a long time. Uh, I remember reading your thesis, dog's mouths are too big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of my junk being engulfed. I, mean, I think the general idea is, is it capable of suffering? That tends to be... Okay. A mouse is capable yeah, of suffering. Yeah, I know. That's why it's general. There isn't a hard rule. Right. I, I agree with you. I think uh, capability of suffering is a big one. I think intelligence is a big one. But a mouse is intelligent. Or yeah. a rat, for sure. Is a rat isn't much more intelligent. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's probably as smart as a dog. Right, and yet smaller and has a really gross tail. So we yeah, have it just no look, problem. That's basically, it looks gross. You right. could do a, a possum, but you couldn't do a bunny rabbit. Well, interesting. They do, they do do rabbits for certain things, right? Yeah, but people aren't very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, because they're cute. We need to yeah. do like naked mole that's rats. That's it. If, to... Is it cute? When you look at it, do you go, aw? You know, and if, if could... you do that, then you can't do anything to it. If we could breed like a less cute chihuahua, and all the personality attributes of a chihuahua, 
but looked like. I mean, they're not really cute dogs to begin yeah, with. Yeah, those are probably Listen, if I, you could if you could do a dog, that'd be the first one they lay. I you. was speaking as a Latina or Filipino chick. I was not <laughs> speaking as myself. All right, question number two: Trimming the fat of a Geno may have some unexpected benefits: less opportunity for mutation, less work for RNA to copy, less raw materials needed to make a cell, etc. What do you think some of the unexpected practical advantages of having a svelte genome might be? Maybe for sperm banks, you can say this guy's got an efficient genome. And, oh, yeah, and yeah. Girls, when I want the efficient kid. That's right, because if you ever watch, they have like catalogs for yeah. women who are looking for this sperm. This person and, went to Harvard, right. and they're this tall. They're 6'3", with this color hair, and this, this, this. This person went has an IQ of 150, all this kind of stuff. Like, One of them could be skinny genome. Which is kind of interesting, because it means those girls go there, and they pick a guy that they would bang to be to look like their kid. So they want their kid to look like someone they would bang. Or I want my kid to just be a tall buff dude. Which is means I would Yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> I mean they also there, added, some Oedipal issues. Okay, fair enough. They also add in things like what does he do? Like they never says play Sega until thirty. That's a big 30. thing of bang a girl's not gonna bang a guy who plays Sega. She bangs the doctor. That's part of what a girl finds attractive. I see what you're saying. Women are shallow. I see what you're saying. We all need to make fake doctor outfits. <laughs> <laughs> what store sells to male strippers? But, I mean, I honestly, I think there could be some advantages. Just seriously, just cancer causing. I mean, without an ability of a bunch of junk DNA to be able to code for proteins if they're sporadically turned on by something like ultraviolet radiation, you would drastically reduce your chance of getting cancer. Depending on the type of cancer, maybe, maybe by a lot. Just think about the fact that every time your body makes uh, some DNA for a cell, it, 90% of it is useless. 90% of the materials they use is useless. Could you imagine if we had construction projects where 90% of the materials were just thrown out afterwards? That would be a shitty construction project. Be a government construction project. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I think you could do a lot more if you, if you narrow that down. I think this will be huge in the future, especially when it comes to designing tailor-made organisms to do certain things. Lightweight, carbon fiber people. Craig Venter of nanotubes. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Venter is is leading the the pack here. He's really doing a bunch of really interesting stuff. And my favorite part is he does get a lot of criticism uh, from scientific ethicists, from the religious right, from a lot of people who claim he's quote unquote playing God or doing something else. My favorite thing is he does not give a fuck about what people think. He is one of the only people I've seen research-wise who, when confronted with that, don't kind of give the, listen, we really understand your concerns and you have very valid things, but I just want to assure you that it's going to be safe. He like literally just kind of goes like, you idiots don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to do whatever I want. He's like the Chad Ocho Cinco <laughs> of the science world. He doesn't care. He'll do what he wants. <laughs> very, very interesting. Let's move on to article number two. It was the malaria in Africa with the candlestick. So malaria has been said to kill more people throughout history than any other cause. It killed half a million people last year alone. More than karate? More than karate and discarded banana peels combined. <laughs> <laughs> it's transmitted by a parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. It's curious as to where this parasite came from. Scientists looked at six different Plasmodium species that affect African apes. Three affect chimps and three affect gorillas. Now, recently, within the last few years, we've discovered that the one that affects human beings actually came from gorillas. That's a little surprising. We're more genetically related to chimps. We have more close contact with chimps in general, so it's a little interesting that it came from gorillas, but it looks like that's where, where it came from. This research kind of narrowed down when and how that happened, which specific side of that it came from, and it's really, really interesting because it came over about 10,000 years ago, which, as we all know, is around the birth of agriculture. So it might mean that it had something to do with kind of developing societies and stuff like that. But I would say the place where it originated, Sub-Saharan Africa, not usually, wasn't, wasn't the hub of agriculture at the time, wasn't the hub of civilization at the time. So even though it is in that civilization window, it isn't necessarily directly linked to it. Again, this isn't a bacterial infection. This isn't a viral infection. That's what we're used to talking about. This is a protozoan. It's literally a little animal that gets in your body and lives in there and causes these problems. It can be incredibly painful. Malaria almost always is. It leads to a lot of deaths. You can have a huge, huge mortality ratio in in third world countries. You're never really over it, even after it goes out of your body, supposedly, even after you, you get over the attack, it will come back throughout your life. Anytime your immune system is down or hampered, it will come back. Likely, if you live to old age, it will be what kills you eventually. If you ever get it, it will be what kills you in the end because your body will be old and, and beaten down and it will get you eventually. It's one so, of the few diseases that forces us to have to destroy an entire ecosystem to get rid of it. It does, because even though it is caused by this protozoan, it's transferred by mosquitoes. So they found 
found differences in the numbers of the genes that the parasite uses to infect red blood cells. The parasites have an ability to alter their host's red blood cells to make them less likely to be detected by the immune system. Whereas most species from this group only have one gene involved in this process, they found that those species that infect African apes had up to 21 of these genes, suggesting that there's a massive increase in the number of genes that could aid in their infectiousness, which is likely the natural response reflection of a disease that is trying really hard to infect human beings. So we've been at war with this thing for 10,000 years, and its adaptability is to constantly find new ways to infect us, including increasing the amount of genes it uses to do that from 1 to 21. So we have some genes, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll have some genes that make us appear like two little rascals on top of each other with a trench coat and to a really gullible... White uh, blood cell so that it can't get you. Yeah, that's exactly correct. (laughs) I'm glad to see that we've put it in terms I can understand. (laughs) So obviously research like this has a huge potential for good just because even if you made a minor alteration, if you were able to help 1% of people who get infected with malaria, there's such a vast majority of people who get infected, killed, or have their lives dramatically changed by malaria that even affecting 1% of people would have a massive global effect. So anytime you see these kind of studies, they're they're always really encouraging and, and really need to think about because even a small little advance of a few percentage points could literally save millions of lives. And they're always killing innocent people in South America and Africa, never people in the American South. They used to, though. They used to kill <laughs> people to. in the American South. We, we used to have malaria. Out the DDT. Yeah. People and from the North <laughs> solved the problem. In the early 1900s, we literally we wiped out entire mosquito populations. Up, uh, we, we, we did that all the way up into the 50s. And that was how we ended up basically curing us of malaria in that, at that time. And giving us serious nerve disease. Yeah. But that is hard to do to broader areas. I mean, we had really concentrated tropical areas in the American South where you can kind of isolate it and do it. Try and do that in the Amazon rainforest. Try and do that in the Congo. Like, you can't. It's too big. You can't really get that done. So the question becomes, like, okay, one, how do we stop malaria once it's already in somebody? And then how do we stop the spread of malaria currently to more people? So It still seems like it would be cheaper to actually just do that. Maybe not with DDT, but some other pesticide doesn't have those horrible side effects. You couldn't, because one of the things in in the American South, they're they're literally in isolated areas. So you'll have a couple square miles of swamp or something, and we drain those swamps. We literally drain the fucking swamps, and uh, and then we use chemicals later to, to clean everything up. But we did massive physical changing of the environment to make this yeah. happen. You could not do that for the Amazon rainforest. We've forever changed the genome of the swamp people of Can Florida. You just dump a bunch of chemicals. Yeah, that's what I mean. We're already just... kind of doing that. So <laughs> super, super interesting. Not only that we got this disease from gorillas and, and not chimps, but that we got it so long ago, ten thousand years ago. We've been fighting it ever since, and they've been fighting back with this increased adaptability to try and fucking kill us every round. Every Die Hard movie should be Die Hard trying to kill malaria. That that would be a better Die Hard one. <laughs> we gave Coco sign language. She gave us malaria. <laughs> Couple of questions for you guys. Number one, we essentially eliminated malaria in the U.S. by going after the mosquitoes that carry the parasites. Should we be looking for mosquito-based cures or parasite-based cures in the future? So that's how we did it in the U.S., right? We went after the mosquitoes. Well, UCSD has just developed a technique for mosquito-based cures. Right, and we do have a few of these that are really innovative that have to do with self, like essentially genetic self-destruct buttons where mosquitoes will go out, they'll interbreed with other mosquitoes, and then they'll die and their offspring will die. We have sterilized mosquitoes well, that we release different. into a population. I, I don't understand it very well, but what they do is the, they, have like a, they turn the gene on. And okay. so when, you, when it procreates, uh-huh. the immunity gets transferred. I don't know exactly what it so is. There's, yeah, like there's that. a latent gene that's yeah. sitting there that's, that is currently in the off position. You turn it back on and you put it and you do it in an epigenetic way where and it can be time, transferred yeah. through reproduction. Every time it procreates, if one of them has it and the other one doesn't, it always wins. Right. And so that, that's another good way, finding an inherent genetic defense against it and turning it on. Couldn't we also get a predator species in, like, like bring in a bunch of toads. It worked for Australia. <laughs> yeah, that's it. there was no problems with that. <laughs> well, I mean, we're talking about everything from you know Zika virus and yellow fever, and all this stuff gets transmitted by mosquitoes. So in some ways, I think don't go after the protozoan that causes malaria specifically. Go after mosquitoes, yeah, mosquitoes. because it's a broader thing. And what, we don't See, need mosquitoes. Nobody has ethical problems with killing mosquitoes, except right. for the Dalai Lama. <laughs> 
You're saying the protozoas are merely victims of the mosquito. Don't blame the protozoa. Blame the mosquito. Well, I'm saying, you know, let's not waste our money going after one thing when we could just go after its boss, you know, and take out everything underneath it. Uh, I think you should do mosquito-based cures. I like a lot of the sterile mosquito plans. I think eventually we are going to create a virus that kills mosquitoes. I think that will be the way we do it. We will have a targeted specific virus that we release into mosquito populations that transmits real quick and just kills them all. Do you think it's possible that aliens have done that? Are you saying that's what the the pyramids are for? I'm saying that aliens have injected people with faulty genes into the human species just to watch human... Okay, humans have... Their society needs to collapse... We're First of all, they, we, don't need, we don't need aliens to help us infuse bad genes. Have you ever seen somebody with bad genes? They infuse it everywhere around them. But that's the aliens who put it in, and then they just watch it, they watch it spread. They love the South. <laughs> Question number two. Considering it's thought to be one of the leading causes of death in human history, malaria is actually a pretty tame name. What would be a more appropriate name for this scourge of scourges? Ball cancer. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with your balls, then and there is something... might think you have... Testicular cancer. That's what he's yeah. referring to, yeah. <laughs> Listen, this is just a name to get the United States Congress to fund it. Like, if they say they're funding bowl cancer no, research. No, no, no. You got to do it, then you do breast cancer. Clearly, you'll get more funding with breast cancer than You're right, you're right. Well, what are you, gay, bro? You want to research ball cancer? Whoa, you're totally gay, dude. The, of course, just, it's the dude from California. You know, raising awareness. That's the best way to make money. We're not going to fix it. We're just going to tell people, and then you give us money to go tell more people. See, we need, like, manipulative scientists to name things in order to influence voters. I just feel like malaria sounds like it could be, like, the, like a well, shitty Swedish mal. name. It has mal, which is bad. Yeah, that's true. Mal is bad. But, like, I don't know, like a... Uh, uh, death bite or uh, <laughs> mosquito fuck you up. Like just something, something that seems a little bit more appropriate for how horrible I mean, that it is. Might be Bloody what, like a, a, a southern scientist might name it. Well, like we call it, we had the fucking Black Death or like the Great Plague yeah, and stuff. Black this death. is fucking malaria. That, that, this, it's not even, this thing kills way more people than the Black Death or the Great Plague. Well, why do why don't we have a sweet name for it? Because it'd be racist to call it the Black Death. <laughs> <laughs> and statistically honest, it kills a lot of black people. It does. <laughs> You know, what if they went the other way? Like, in the American South, they call diabetes the sugars. Like, it's kind of like a sweet name for a terrible disease. Okay. So what's a cuddly name for malaria? The fevers? <laughs> oh, he just got a little bit of the fever. He got, you know, <laughs> he got a little bit of the blood peoples. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting. You could either go, yeah, you go one way or, or another. It's either the big fat guy named Tiny, where we call it something sweet and nice, or you just give it a Black Death type name where it sounds badass. It's like you something call that it- haunts you for life. Like a really bad marriage in the 1930s. <laughs> diamond killer. Because it kills all, the, all those diamond miners. Oh, that's true. And that's important to us. <laughs> How are you going to get married if those diamond miners are dead? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move right on to Science Fighters. Science Fighters. And Science Fighters. Which side are you on? It's a little confusing, I know. It's a double entendre. You know what? Just listen. You'll, you'll like it. All right. And this week's science fighter is the Australian government. I'm not going to take a guess. I'm getting kicked in the nuts either way. <laughs> uh, Damien, you're actually wrong there. The Australian <laughs> government is fighting science, not fighting for science. <laughs> oh, fucking course. I know. I know. I, Tony s- Abbott. Soon enough, you'll figure out how this works out, Damien. <laughs> it is sad to watch you keep trying, though. I will tell I'm, you that. I'm flailing. It is like watching a three-year-old trying to work a Nautilus machine. Like, doesn't know what it's going to do and couldn't do it if it wanted to. Seb, when they came for me, you said nothing. (laughs) (laughs) The Australian government's medical science funding body has announced two grants to investigate whether wind farms damage health. This is despite the same body finding no evidence for the theory. The decision's been heavily criticized by health researchers, the wind industry, and science comedy podcasts. So basically, (laughs) there is a bunch of nutballs who have ideas that things hurt them that don't hurt them. This has been around forever, whether it's electromagnetic radiation. There are people who think why... Yeah, vaccines. People think Wi-Fi hurts them. People have pulled their kids out of schools and sued schools because they believe that Wi-Fi is hurting their kid. I work for the telecommunications industry. Nothing has hurt our service as much as Wi-Fi. <laughs> when everybody needed a hardline connection. So this is this all centers around it's the descendants idea. of the telegram inventors. <laughs> yeah, we're going the way of the dodo. <laughs> this all centers around the idea of wind turbine syndrome, which most medical research on the topic suggests does not exist. And the NHMRC announced that a one point three million dollar grant will go to Dr. Peter Catchside of Flinders University to investigate whether wind farms affect sleeping patterns. This is actually very intelligent of this guy. Yeah, because yeah. Because this is actually, I think I've noticed this is a common trait to make up a problem 
get the funding. community right. all hyped up, and then you get funding for a problem that doesn't exist. You just pocket the money. And here, Andrew Wakefield's laughing all the way to the <laughs> bank. Right, and, and it's funny because people are like, oh, it's for sleep problems. That's almost possibly buyable. If you're like, there's some kind of sound and you can't hear it, but some way it keeps us up. I don't buy it, but if you got to research it, even though we've researched it to death nonstop, that's almost buyable. They also gave $1.9 million for a broader study on the effects of low frequency or infrared sound from wind farms on health, which is a lot more dubious because they're looking at things like hair loss and accelerated aging. Wait, wait, wait. This is like balding men who have toupees who've walked by this wind farm and have been embarrassed in social situations. It blew yes. the toupee up? <laughs> I'd believe Oh that. my god, oh my god, this wind turbine must be causing me to go bald. And then it causes stress, and then they die young. <laughs> That's a legitimate vote. If there was something that blew the socks out of women's bras, then there would be <laughs> equal outrage at the feminist community. So really interesting, the WTS appears to be particularly acute in Australia, although there have also been reports from the UK and North America. However, the populations of Germany, Denmark, and Spain, where large-scale wind turbines are far more common, are sighted much closer to houses than in Australia, appear to be immune. That's usually the sign that it's more of a cultural issue than an actual disease issue. Made up issue. Maybe it's like an atom bomb. Maybe the the, the lucky ones are close to it. And hey, everybody all, like lives. all those people in Hiroshima who survived, and then the people in Russia who died as a result of Hiroshima. Exactly. Like, Ground I mean, zero. All yeah. those people <laughs> they lived a happy survived. life. <laughs> and much like an atomic bomb, there are no reports of conditions from non-English speaking countries. Oh, no, wait, that's not how atomic bombs work. <laughs> Maybe that's because the regulatory agencies just don't listen to non-English speaking voices. Well, what, I'll tell you what they did find is that numerous investigations into WTS have concluded that sufferers are almost exclusively people who, before the construction of wind farms, were told by anti-wind advocates <laughs> that the farms would be detrimental to their health. So actually, the people we have to get rid of are the anti-wind advocates. That's true. They're causing the harm. That we're, is very true. We're punishing people for being educated on a subject. Maybe a lot of other people are like, I hear this ringing in my ears. I can't sleep, but I don't know what's causing it. Nevertheless, many members of the current Australian government have promoted claims for WTS combined with extensive attacks on wind energy and the promotion of coal. You got to love this. They're like, we got to get those fucking turbines out of the way. They might be causing sheep not to sleep correctly. Now send those guys to die back in that coal mine. (laughs) Now I understand everything. It's the coal industry. It is, but it's also nutty in people, because I've told you before, I've been the lead archaeologist on wind farms being constructed before, and that means you have to go through all these government hearings, and the people who come up, let me tell you, those aren't coal people. I don't actually think they're nutty. I think they've just figured out a way of getting funding for a non-existent problem. You're not talking about people getting funding either. You're talking about community advocates. You're talking about the people who are like, this is going to ruin us, we're going to be destroyed. Yeah, a lot of times it's hippies, a lot of times it's people who don't have jobs and stay at home and stuff, but but they're nuts. the same group of people. They're a nuts group who have decided something and they don't understand the scientific process. It's not that I'm saying there's no possibility a uh, windmill could ever affect you. What I'm saying is we've researched it extensively and all the research says it doesn't. So unless you have other research or something to show, you just stating your wild, insane hypothesis, by the way, not a theory. I hate it when they call it a theory because it's not one. You stating your wild hypothesis is absolutely irrelevant to how we should conduct no, no, business. No, because they have feelings and you're <laughs> telling them their feelings are wrong. And I'm telling them that that wind farm is wrong, god damn it. Seb's right. We should bring back more of a shame currency society. <laughs> like It's like the, the way the Japanese have it. Seppuku. In any case, don't worry about uh, wind turbines. They're not going to hurt you, but I'll tell you what. Well, will. they might if you walk underneath one at the wrong moment. Uh, you, if you're a pussy. Wait, how would you get hit? Well, I guess you wouldn't have to. If you were on a scaffolding underneath right. one, then you might be. You, yeah, this is true. a serious problem. That, that is kills true. like almost one person a year. <laughs> it kills a whole lot of uh, windmill painters. I'll tell you that. <laughs> 0.5% of the Sigilif community who lives in desert communities suffer from this. <laughs> you keep telling me how completely harmless they are. Why don't you tell that to my dead friend Don Quixote over here? <laughs> and speaking of dead friends, let's move right into everybody's favorite game, I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. All right, guys, this is I Call BS. It's the game in which I read four science articles, and my guests compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yeah, I'm coming off a win. It's true. You are coming off your lone win, I believe, in 2016. You're going to shit on that some more? <laughs> just stating the fact. Yeah, I'm just stating a fact that you ruined a unbeaten streak of being <laughs> beaten all the time. 
I mean, let's see what you can do today. Let's see what you can bring to the table. Imagine the movie Rudy, where after he got that sack, his entire team just came out and just started beating him on the field. <laughs> Article number one. New research suggests that country birds are smarter than city birds. Article number two. A man caught his sister's kiwi allergy after a bone marrow transplant. Article number three. Research shows that 8% of human DNA is made up of non-human infusions. And article number four. New research shows that epidemic dysentery, the worldwide scourge, originated in Central Africa. In fact, it originated within 100 miles of where HIV originated. Let's go see how our panelists do follow along at home and see how you do article number one. New research suggests that country birds are smarter than city birds. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science, but if you watch country bird TV, you'd believe the opposite. They want to build a wall, and they're all voting for bird Trump. <laughs> but don't make them pay for the wall. <laughs> the and, bird Mexican. <laughs> and Seb. I think it's bad science. I would, I would have guessed it the other way around, that the city birds are smarter. All right, article number two. A man caught his sister's kiwi allergy after a bone marrow transplant. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and it's tragic because his fiance was from New Zealand. So she, yeah, so she was a kiwi. Could, like, listen, I, I can't touch you anymore. I just break out into hives <laughs> every time. Completely allergic to his fiance. What a horrible life that poor man has to leave. And I Seb. Love pepper. I think it's science, but they're just using some euphemisms as kiwi for herpes and <laughs> bone marrow transplant for a good. A good I don't dog. think you have a herpes allergy. I think that's just herpes. <laughs> that's when you break out. Most people are like, well, I don't have her. I don't, I'm a carrier, but I I'm just to allergic give. to herpes <laughs> around me. Article number three research shows that 8% of human DNA is made up of non human infusions. Damien. Is this science or bad science? This is bad science. It's much lower. But it'd be much higher if I had anything to say about it. <laughs> That's true. Your frequent bestiality would infuse some <laughs> random genetic, non-human genetic material in us. And Seb. Uh, I think this is good science, and it confirms the widely held scientific belief that women are lesser humans than men. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and article number four. New research shows that epidemic dysentery, the worldwide scourge, originated in Central Africa within 100 miles of where HIV originated. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. It wasn't epidemic dysentery. It was Down syndrome. Just originated in one place, and then it was carried throughout the world. <laughs> the human scourge, yeah. Via the Special Olympics fomite, it spread throughout the world. <laughs> that was the Silk Road of its day. <laughs> <laughs> and Seb. Uh, I think this seems plausible. I'm going to say it's science was just confirmed Central Africa is another heaping pile of shit. Yeah, let's go back and see how they did. Just follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one, new research suggests that country birds are smarter than city birds. Both of you guys thought this one was false, and this one is bad science. That's liberal Jew media telling you that. <laughs> Seb is exactly right. It is the opposite. New research on bullfinches in Barbados testing the problem-solving abilities of urban bullfinches versus rural ones showed that the urban ones showed better problem-solving skills. Not necessarily surprising. You're going to need a different set of more evolving, highly complex problem-solving skills if you're living in a city environment with human beings. Article number two, a man caught his sister's kiwi allergy after a bone marrow transplant. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is... Science. It is the first ever definitive case of the transfer of an allergy due to a transplant. When patients undergo intensive treatment for acute leukemia, the high doses of chemotherapy used to kill the cancer cells also destroys the bone marrow cells. These include a specific stem cell which divide and give rise to every type of cell found in your blood, from red blood cells to white blood cells. This means that the leukemia patients then had to undergo a bone marrow transplant from a donor in order to get their bones repopulated with those kind of cells. When you do that, you're essentially inheriting somebody else's immune system. Immunity is where allergies come from. He inherited his sister's allergies. That's a very, very interesting story. If I couldn't eat Reese's anymore after my sister gave me an out, like I'd, right. I, don't, I, think I don't think I could forgive her. Just be passive aggressiveness all day. Yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> But why? <laughs> <laughs> and it, what's interesting is that might be a thing that we have to start looking at when we start scanning donors of things like bone marrow or blood or something like that. Do you have allergies? Because it turns out if, if it's something that that allergy is going to negatively affect that person's entire life, yeah. we might need to find a different right. donor. Better they stay with leukemia. Right. Better leukemia. <laughs> All right. Article number three. Research shows that 8% of human DNA is made up of non-human DNA infusions. Damien thinks this is false. Seb thinks this is true. And this one is Science. 
Very, very interesting. We talked about it a little bit last week when we talked about GMOs and horizontal gene transfer. So 19 new pieces of ancient viral DNA have been uncovered within our own genome. Perhaps most strikingly, the full genetic recipe for an entire virus was found within 2% of people examined. That's super interesting. That means that if you take this 2% of the human population, pull out their DNA, pull out this one specific strand of DNA that codes for a virus, it has the whole virus. Normally, it's just little snippets that you get in, infused in your DNA. It means we can pull this thing out, and it can actually start reproducing and have the RNA for a virus, a, a functioning, working virus. I can't believe we ate the whole thing. <laughs> That's true. We did. <laughs> we ate the whole goddamn thing in our genome. The fragments are known as... Human endogenous retroviruses, or HERVs, and the research found 19 new ones, adding to the 17 previously identified ones. Really, the interesting one is that whole, that one that's a whole virus, the entire genetic information of a whole virus that's just kind of, like we talked about, being selfish DNA. That has been replicated over and over and over again, and it's never had to code for anything. Does it's selfish and lazy. If you get the virus and you have that, then you start reproducing somehow? No, no coding. How much of the malaria virus do we have in our genome, thanks to horizontal gene transfer? Well, as we just talked about, malaria is a protozoan, not a virus at all, and none. So, <laughs> And lastly, article number four, new research shows that epidemic dysentery, the worldwide scourge, originated in Central Africa within 100 miles of where HIV originated. Damien thinks this is false. Seb thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. Meaning that Steb, as the scientist with the tie, is still the winner. Congratulations, <laughs> Seb, for demolishing Damien, getting back on the beating Damien streak. I had a big push in the fourth quarter and nothing. I, <laughs> nothing. I scored the touchdown. Nope. And, and still, it, like usual, you fell up short. It was embarrassing for both of us <laughs> to have to see. But you know what? At least things feel right again. You are losing again. It's like when you see somebody do their catchphrase. Like Fat Albert comes in, he's like, hey, hey, hey. You're like, that's right. That feels right. That's how it feels when you're, you're losing. basically the Washington Generals to the Harlem Globetrotters. You are the Roger Goodell and you are the Tom Brady of this goddamn league. <laughs> and let me uh, deflate some of Seb's balls a little bit more by explaining <laughs> you how this works. It turns out that epidemic dysentery actually originated in Europe. They analyzed more than 330 strains of the type 1 dysentery isolated between 1915, which came from soldiers in World War I, and 2011. The strains had been collected in 35 international institutes in 66 countries, and they found that type 1 strain had existed since at least the 18th century and spread throughout the globe. So contrary to popular belief, the study shows that the dysentery pathogen that's currently endemic in Africa and Asia is actually of European origin. So this is one where Europe exported the fucking disease to the rest of the country. people fucking over right. Africans once again. This God the, damn it! And Asians! This is the bubonic plague and the rat all over again. <laughs> we just we just screwed them. Europeans scapegoat everything. I think that's what we're learning, the Jews. Uh, speaking of a scapegoat, <laughs> way to fuck that job up again, Damien. Just ruin it. I call BS every time, Son as if bitch. you're not trying, or as if you're trying to not try. I'm not sure which one is harder to take. And let's move right on to Noble Nerds. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where we honor Noble Laureates, the world's most educated virgins. Jumbo friends, and welcome to another Noble Nerds, where a guy who's been killing it sexually at Trump rallies tells you about another great person. Today's nerd is none other than Hans Alfen. Yes, the Hans Alfen. Hans won the 1970 Nobel Prize for his work on magnetohydrodynamics, which is a study of the magnetic properties of electrically conducting fluids. It should be noted, however, that his work on electrically conducting fluids did come with its fair share of controversy. As one colleague put it, having a grad student stimulate one's prostate with an electric prod simply is not science. He described the class of magnetohydrodynamics, or MHD waves, now known as Alphen waves. Though they do share the same name, the waves were not named after Hans the Scientist, but America's favorite illegal alien, ALF. Alphen also made contributions to plasma physics and the dynamics of plasma waves in the Milky Way galaxy. Alphen also made many contributions to plasma physics the dynamics of the plasmas in the Milky Way galaxy, and the terrestrial magnetosphere, the one place Cerebro couldn't research. <laughs> Took a long time for me to get to an X-Men joke. Yeah, I was <laughs> waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, I like to keep you guessing. I'm the Muhammad Ali, I rope a dope you till the end. All right, so I have one question for you. Alvin's work was disputed for many years by senior scientists in space physics. Problems with the peer review system did not seem to benefit young Hans in the same manner it did the senior scientist, forcing this brilliant man to publish in lesser known journals because his ideas disputed current models. We have mentioned how costly it is to access peer-reviewed journals. What other nerd problems are there out there that us cool people can't relate to? 
Oh, let's see. Oh, winning, getting, winning. I call BS. That's a big one for you, Seb. Right? Getting late, I think, is a common yeah, one. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, that. big time. <laughs> Women love autism. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think most of our problems center around winning games on science podcasts. That one's hard a lot. Uh, understanding the world around us. You know, inventing planes, things yeah. like that. Yeah, just, just all that kind of stuff. Like, it's, it's very difficult on us. One scientist invented a plane. Two scientists invented the plane. I don't even think they were scientists. They were like bicycle shop owners. Uh, what do we, you call a scientist then, in the 1930s? You know, I was a patent clerk. I got to tell you something. The main thing that nerds have to worry about is all the work we have to do to get non-nerds out of trouble. Like... You know, like when people like you walk into a, let's say you go to the bathroom and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you forget how a doorknob works and you uh-huh. can't get out. And then you just start randomly throwing your body into different structures in the actual bathroom and a feeble attempt to get help for yourself. You make me regret calling you that one time <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> regularly. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to go and be like, oh, I got to go over to Damien's house and let him out of the bathroom again. You got caught. It was uh, an Arby's, but thank you for saying it was my house. <laughs> That's one of our big problems. I think the idea that he had to publish in a lower level journal also is kind of phasing out in terms of what problems people people would have in modern day. While you have to pay to access journals now and to put your papers in, you have things like Plus One, which are really well-known open source journals that you can do online that are high quality and peer reviewed. I think a lot of the problems that we see for people like that, that were kind of not in the scientific elite when they should have been, are going away based on the the democratization of information. The ability of researchers to publish very inexpensively across the world instantaneously with brand new research. And what used to happen is the big research institutions would cut you out. They would see you were about to publish something. They would basically publish something first. And because they're a bigger name, they'd get credit for it. You can't do that anymore because now if I'm ready with my paper and it's going through peer review, I don't have to worry about somebody else stealing my paper or writing something else because that's going to be published in four hours, not four months. And so I think a lot of the things you're talking about, about problems he had, thankfully is going away in science, though it probably still exists a little bit. I mean, it's just political problems that exist in every field. There's is that why Craig Venter has been cut out? Like He's not cut out of shit. He's a multimillionaire who lives in La Jolla and just fucking does whatever he wants. That's why he's rogue. He's yeah. a maverick in the science community. I mean, Seb, that used to be a problem, right? I don't know about it as much in it's physics. It's still a problem. There's but you can, politics. you can open it source. Yeah, it doesn't affect the, the peer review so much. Right. It affects other things. Right. It affects funding and it affects ability to like do things. Like awards are pretty much all politics. Yeah. And you get funding if you get awards. And But what I've tried to explain to people, and I think a lot of people don't get, is when it comes to science, it's not like a lot of people have like political conspiracy theories and stuff. There is nobody who can stop you from publishing. When somebody says, oh, the government doesn't want that information out, too fucking bad for them. They're not my peer reviewer. There's no way for them to stop me from publishing this it's not it's usually not i think from the government it's from like competing yes scientists absolutely and so so that is i think that's an important distinction to make is like a lot of people have those type of conspiracy theories on the way science works because they think science is like anything else like commerce you know if you're big enough you can crush the little guy no you can't because all i have to do is put this out i don't have to sell it to anybody i literally just have to get it published and then boom that's in the can and that's what we have seb when you hear the nobel prize winner for physics do you just think that's all politics he didn't deserve it. Uh, well, he probably deserved it, but it is all politics. There is some politics involved. I mean, it? there are plenty of people who deserve the Nobel Prize who haven't gotten it. Yeah, Leo has been going on 20 years now, and they haven't given him that damn Nobel Prize. Seb's voting for the Bernie Sanders of physics, who will never get elected to a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been Nobel Nerds. All right. Thanks, Seb, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And demolishing again. Damien like nothing. In a tie. That in a brutal ass kicking tie, I couldn't bear to watch her half the time. And thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 115. Come on back next week for Science Faction 116. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.